So once again, um, I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of uh, this whole event, and I thought I would bring it home by moderating the final Q&A, since I haven't actually got much chance to stand up here all day long. I've been hiding in the back and making Tom do all the work. Um, so what I was hoping for is that we can have lots of questions from this side of the room and then immediately a question from this side of the room. So Tom has to keep running back and forth. <laughs> if you guys can arrange that for me, I would really appreciate it. Um, and so would Tom. Um, I, I guarantee it. Uh, but uh, to start with, what I'd like to do is do the introductions again so that uh, we have that on record for the, for the, <laughs> for the, the <laughs> historical <laughs> record of this for the illustrious event. Yes. Um, so let's start with Omar. Uh, go ahead. Omar Sultan, uh, product line manager for SDN stuff at Cisco. Colin McMurray, Chief Cloud Architect, Director of the Cloud Practice at Nexus IS. Neil Ishak, I'm Executive Director of the Open Daylight Project. George Simon, CEO of Grid Store. John Hudson, Principal Engineer, Office Studio. Oh, sorry. There we go. That would help <laughs> Oh boy. There we go. All right. John There's Hudson. always one. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, John Hudson, Principal Engineer, Office of CTO, Brocade. Turn that up. Word your mouth. There. There we go. Oh, that's going to fall off. <laughs> okay. Lovely. Okay. So to get this started off, um, I think that uh, to get us back uh, on the, the, the intended topic, or at least my intended topic, uh, one of the things that I really keyed off on this morning, one of the most you know, important statements to me was, Neela, when you were talking about the importance of having open source and lots of contributors into a common core for the Software Defined Data Center versus, well, your other life, <laughs> having a common core be a uh, corporate definition of the Software Defined Data Center. To me, this is the important question when it comes to Software Defined Data Center. Is Software Defined Data Center simply a marketing term that applies to a single company's products? Or is Software Defined Data Center a thing that's bigger than that, that is an industry trend and that requires an industry platform? I know what my answer is. My answer is that this is a big industry trend. This is an important industry trend and this is a thing. I lead uh, seminars uh, for my friends at Truth and IT, and uh, I, one of the things that I talk about is software defined, and I basically explode the myth that software defined is merely a stupid marketing term. <laughs> I do the same for cloud, by the way. Um, cloud is a thing, software defined is a thing, and I think that it's bigger than uh, the, you know, what you might think based on it just being a company's marketing term that, well, somebody invented. So. Uh, I'm seeing some heads nodding. Who wants to take that and run with it a little bit? And then we're going to ask for uh, discussion with the audience. Uh, Colin, I think. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll start on it. I think that a lot, of, uh, a lot of companies do use it for marketing, just like cloud SDN is overused. I think fundamentally there's a trend. Hey, buddy. Um, uh, there's fundamentally a trend of organizations using uh, modern application development tools and technologies to manage infrastructure. Um, and so you have a consistent infrastructure between your application, your server, your system, your storage, your network. In that sense, the software defined data center, in some cases in, in, um, in manufacturers um, or vendors talk about their component that fits into it. A lot of times you hear them talking about APIs. Um, it, it, you'll hear uh, a DevOps engineers talking about config management. You'll hear software engineers talking about test driven development. Um, fundamentally, the, when you say, is it real? There are people that actually implement it as um, an agile software development team using test-driven de development. In that case, it's very real, and there's a lot of people that use it every day. Um, we're still in the infancy of adoption across the world, though, and there's still a lot further to go and a lot more lessons le to learn. Anyone else have sure. something to add here? <clears throat> so, again, taking a more narrow view, it's easier with storage than data center, but even looking at software-defined storage, first of all, I. A year ago, I avoided our company being defined as software-defined storage because I wasn't sure what it was, wasn't sure anybody would care what it was. There's still days I don't think people care what it is. <laughs> uh, you're out trying to solve a problem. But um, you know, now SNEA has started to work on a definition for software-defined storage. Again, I'm not sure that's good or bad standards. <laughs> Too early, may not always, but I like their definition, so it was a good thing. Yeah. Um, they have a history of having 
very encompassing definition. Yes, so which is what that. scares me. Right. Broad <laughs> definition. Very broad. Yes. Um, and, and then by the same token, uh, I was talking to an analyst uh, a couple weeks ago, and I named four companies that are in the software-defined storage space, and I said, three of those I don't even compete with. So, you know, what does it mean and all is an interesting challenge, but I, I do think if you take it up enough levels to talk about management, to talk about, and some things, you know, do I use commodity hardware, do I not use commodity hardware, what is commodity hardware? Um, you know, I, I think trying to drive the cost of the hardware down, trying to improve management, there is a real win in there, and I think it does encompass the whole data center, um, but even taking it from that view, it is real. Um, I can't tell you the number of enterprise, i.e. Wall Street companies I've talked to, that are looking for ways to be able to meet the capacity, meet their growth needs, meet their management needs, um, as well as these mid-sized companies who have different sets of needs but are getting them addressed with these concepts. So I think it's a real thing. How about anybody in the audience? Does anybody have a comment or question? Uh, there we go, thank you, all right. Tony Burke, ladies and gentlemen, Tony Burke. <laughs> Duck. All right, this is going to sound a little bit like a, I got, I got one note here, but this is a, con, a question specifically for Colin, because uh, we talked about um, legacy apps before, um, and, and, and OpenStack is, I, I think is, is sort of how you um, build new apps, but um, how is OpenStack in, the, in that kind of environment? Is that meant to, is, is there any integration with sort of legacy apps when we're dealing with things in the, uh, the pet model versus the cattle model? Or, you know, just comment on that or? Yeah, absolutely. So it's easy to be kind of look at the beard and the mustache and think of me as an open source Nazi, uh, which many times can be true. Um, that being said, um, <laughs> you I have the looks. <laughs> well, and we all love we all love our open source communities. We all love we. Lots of times we focus on the net new applications. Um, a lot of times, my specific development team we develop net new applications. Um, when a lot of people don't realize we, internally we also optimize delivery of existing infrastructure, and so. Um, half billion dollar company. Oddly enough, people do stuff over and over again. It makes sense to automate it. Um, the reality is that you're responsible for managing both, both on the technology but also the process. And a lot of people forget about process and skills, right? So you have your ITIL or ITSM based infrastructures, your enterprise virtualization, your VMware, your Microsofts of the world, right? Um, these are real and they're going to stay around for a very long time. These applications tend to enter steady state and you end up optimizing how you manage them, sometimes using the same tools and release patterns that you do in things like OpenStack. At the same time, as your development team shift over from creating or consuming legacy-based applications to kind of an agile software development model, um, you work with systems where every time you submit code, they run through a very complex set of tests, and that your data set to pass these tests and give your, give your dev teams feedback to get to these kind of new cloudy type applications, um, you have to be able to programmatically control your infrastructure completely, else an entire, it, it absolutely breaks. Anything that you consume, you have to programmatically control. OpenStack, Amazon are great for things like this. And so the reality is, and I think this is, if you look at what Red Hat's been, been talking about, the Red Hat Summit last week, they talked about cloud forms, right? Simplifying the presentation layer of enterprise virtualization and open cloud side by side, unifying those two with their past layers. I think past is incredibly relevant, whether it be, uh, whether it be Cloud Foundry, whether it be OpenShift or whatever, but it, it's, you really have to realize that your IT organizations, your customer base, I mean, you can be funded through Palo Alto, you will not have to focus. If you're a funded organization where you, have, you don't have legacy apps, absolutely, you are not gonna be focused on VMware, you're gonna run on Amazon, or, or Amazon, and then as you mature and scale locally, probably on OpenStack. Um, but for the majority of IT users here, you really have to think about test-driven development, configur configuration release management, of multi and abstraction between multi-cloud platforms. And a lot of times as you mature, you basically there, you get to a level of maturity where you can ensure quality programmatically. At the point when you get to about 80% of the features in your app can be uh, tested and, and, te and, and uh, gated by your system. Only at that point are you really mature enough to be able to deploy into the classic cloud platforms. Um, and at the same time, one of the challenges that you know, I've had in my own organization, we have 332 engineers. I run a small R&D team that has been branching out and, or, and going through for the past probably two years an organizational transition is with these new cloudy type apps, cloudy type platforms, 
that you tend to use agile methodologies. So you move away from ITIL, ITSM, and, and PMO, PMBOK to uh, a, a Agile and Scrum and Kanban, for example. Uh, and so the processes as well as the tooling changes. Um, but both do live side by side. And over time, we'll see kind of probably over the next five to 10 sh years, we'll see the percentages shifting, shifting, shifting. But the reality is, is you should be able, that you need to be able to support both. And you can actually use a lot of software defined tools to improve the levels of availability, manageability, and quality of even your invert side. Did that answer your question? You're right to be afraid. Um, you'd be surprised. Software developers, um, so you know, I get 20 offices across the nation, spend a lot of my time. I'm a, I'm a management by walking around guy. I don't, I don't believe that you can lead from the top in an ivory tower. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to my engineers, my salespeople, um, my customers. I'm all over the nation. And one consistent fact on the software development side. So IT organizations tend to be under constraints of their customers' internal software development. And um, on the software dev side, they have a choice whether or not to use IT based on what services are provided, right? So most IT services are a service catalog, right? I can put in a ticket. Um, even in my own internal IT environment, there's some services that I can use for my software development team, some services that I have to stand up internally or use external. Use Amazon most of the time and OpenStack locally on a constrained resource. Um, the, the reality is, is about 5% of software development organizations is like this thin oil slick across America and the world. GE develops Agile, one of the oldest, slowest, most ugly networking companies you've ever seen. Just joking. Um, <laughs> no, e even Cisco is in an Agile transition. They make networking ASICs, right? Um, it, it is consistent, and what happens is you can release from like 24 months to 12 months to six months to three months to two weeks, right? It allows you to go ahead and release quicker and quicker and quicker. And this is something where your Microsoft admins do it, or your Microsoft developers do it, your non-Microsoft developers do it. It's very, it's quite common. Well, let me ask, let me, let me get a follow on in there. I'm trying to give you a Co joke. Colin, you're, 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 you're mingling agile <laughs> with software defined. Uh -huh. Is that necessary or are these two separate things and, and let's ask somebody else. Let's, let's see what, uh, what, other, what other folks say, because I'm seeing some heads moving. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll get back to that quick question. Yeah. There's something else that I wanted to say before, which I think part of what th this question, your answer, and I think your earlier question are all touching upon is, I noticed something that happens around technology and marketing, which I think I, I, I kind of want to call the elephant in the room, which is typically where things start off, whether you're talking about cloud, software-defined data center, software-defined network, working, they all start with a real problem. People look out in the world, talk to end users, and say, there's an issue. Yeah, if SDN we look was developed because networks yeah, weren't cloud programmable. providers had a problem, right? Yes. Absolutely, right? And whether it's SDDC or SDN at their heart, both of them come from the fact that our, our infrastructure isn't agile enough. We find ourselves needing to deal with hardware stuff for almost any change that we have. Right? And people say there must be a better way. And so you start getting really intelligent minds who go, okay, I see a problem. I think I might see a solution. And they begin to imagine what a solution might be. And then you get to a consensus. Unfortunately, what happens at that point is the marketing arms of all of these organizations hear about this. And you go from the SDDC, and I'll give you, I was you know, at the front of seeing this, you go from the SDDC being a fabulous aspirational vision. This, we would like to get to a fully automated data center, and the way we need to get to it is to abstract pool and automate everything. To suddenly something appearing in a magazine at an airport somewhere that says the SDDC is here. Yeah. And you go, what? With a market cap. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Right? You yeah. start I've seen that ad in uh, at San Francisco Airport. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. And, and I'm not actually going to point fingers at any one company because I see it everywhere. Is you went from I have no idea what a software defined storage array is to well we have it. And we're in the metric quadrant. <laughs> so you're stupid yes. If you don't. Uh, and so you're stupid if you don't. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then the funny one is you'll find this accompaniment. And then you get all the people who said, you know what? This whole <laughs> X new marketing term I came up with it 12 years ago. It wasn't called that, but I came up with it. Mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, as we get to that, then people sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, oh, well, it's all marketing fluff because clearly the world hasn't changed that much in two and a half years. Clearly, it doesn't fully deliver on it. And I personally think, I think for those of us, and I think most of the people in the room are this way, we need to ignore some of the hype, marketing hyperbole and go back to saying there is a problem. Thank God as an industry, we've imaginated where the solution might be. We are progressing towards it. 
And for the most part, what I see in storage is we see storage that over the next five or 10 years is going to, is going to get more abstracted. There is going to be more of a concept of, hey, there's a logical array there. I don't have to manage LUNs. On the networking side, I see a world in which VLANs go away. <laughs> and I don't have to deal with all of those. I see a world in which I can make a call in an OpenStack-like environment and say, create network. And we're moving down that. Now, the reality is that's not going to come overnight. As much as all of us would like to. Now, it doesn't make for a really nice marketing message to say, hey, we're slightly more software defined than we were yesterday, <laughs> right? Marketers wouldn't have a job. But the reality for those people who actually work on real technology is it is something like that. Real change, momentous change, takes five, five to 10 years out there. And it, it's not just about the technology being invented, it's actually about how you deploy it. Is ITIL good or bad? It isn't, it's necessary, it's there. And we've had lots of conversations around how do things change when a new way, when a new technology, when a new approach appears. Lots, we've got top quartile uh, operators in the world, we've got bottom quartile operators. And if you want something to become standard, all four quartiles of operators have to be able to figure out how to work with it. With it excellent that. point, because one of the dangers is that you get too much hype up, everyone's expectations get built up, mm -hmm. and then a good technology might even not get its day because of all the expectations and mismanagement right. that happens. Absolutely. But I think the other piece of that is, part of the marketing is you get enamored with a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. And it might not just be the right solution. I mean, we talk, we, this other sweet stream about legacy apps, right? The reality is a lot of customers are not going to refactor an existing app that's up and running to work on some of this stuff. Well, it's not worth it, literally. It's, I mean, there's, yeah, there's no ROI, but, yeah, you know, new notes, stuff. Anyone? Lotus <laughs> I mean, but new stuff probably makes, you know, it makes sense to start building with in, in mind, build with, you know, an AWS, you know, survivability model in mind, or build with, uh, you know, elastic infrastructure in but mind. But don't give up. Well, it takes a well, while. It, it, yeah. But also, from a technology point of view and things we deliver, don't forget about the legacy. I mean, remember how many people were writing COBOL 14 years ago to deal with Y2K? Still, run, um, still running COBOL. 55% so, <laughs> of enterprises still have I COBOL I knew there was code. something, buddy. Well, I, but I think it, there's, you know, like Agile's been overused. Software Defined's been overused. Cloud and SDN is overused. We can all get in a nice discussion about the plumbing wars, about VXLAN versus NVGRE versus STT versus whatever, which is a giant distraction of project, product management to stop you from purchasing Intel general availability of products by all vendors, by the way. Know the game that's being played against you. Um, but more than that, there's a shift towards um, over IT technology infrastructure. There used, used to do, we used to be relying on mass inspection for quality in our infrastructure. Really smart, really certified individuals. Um, good processes and procedures to make sure that we can contain faults, change control windows at ungodly hours in the middle of the weekend. Um, and this used to be true in software development too, QA used to be then. And so the fundamental shift in like agile infrastructure, agile being an over, overused word, but agile's been around since 2000 by the way. And so it's a project, it's a methodology of team communication and breaking down tasks. The, this notion of test driven development of programmatically releasing state into a system, of writing tests that make sure that darn thing actually worked before it got submitted into the system, of having systems that automate and log every single test that's run and then release it into production following proper rules and responsibilities. Um, this, is, this is technology that isn't constrained to OpenStack. You can do this with VMware today, right now, right? This is tech, these same uh, methodologies are what modern software developers use. And so when I hear software defined data center, when I hear, hear cloud, when I hear STN, I see plenty of people that go throw up their stuff, they go and log onto an Amazon console, they spin up a VM and they're no better than where they were before. Then I see uh, other people that look at it as a maturity model. Right between service design, so uh, so, uh, design operation, QA test and management visibility, and that they step forward in, in levels of maturity. Right, they start I don't know checking their configs in the source code. They start writing tests with it. They start making sure that it pings in their QA environment before putting it in. They do simple templates. There's things that you can do today, and that as our infrastructure has APIs. As we start, you know, I just got off the phone with the guys from Chef about Im improving some of the stuff in, in, the, in NetDev, right? As we're starting to simplify the abstraction between infrastructure we consume, it enables us to kind of put, the, put our seatbelts on as we run our IT infrastructures. And what's really cool right now is all these tech vendors are coming out with stuff that actually makes, is capable of that instead of writing like crappy expect scripts and just a whole bunch of like glue. But, I mean, Yes, I, mean, I agree with all that. Is, yeah. I mean, you can do some amazingly cool stuff. But I also, also got to wonder if you're an enterprise buyer, certainly sitting in the line of business, 
that seems like a whole lot of work, right? I mean, why can't I just turn up an instance in Amazon, turn up, you know, build stuff on top of Salesforce? That seems, if that, in my emphasis on my business, what my customer is doing, that seems like it's a hell of a lot easier it is. than trying to stand all this stuff. And I think Ed asked the question earlier on, is for all the things we talked about, what's, you know, for an enterprise IT organization, what's the net value add you bring back to your lines of business? Yeah. Saying, okay, I'm gonna make this big investment in SDDC. This is something that Rackspace or Amazon or Salesforce or whoever can't provide yeah. that it has I to be can. Part of your and I think advantage. that's kind of- It has to matter to your business. It, it has to actually be part of where your profit comes from. Oh no, I think there's one missing piece in here. S line of business and software road. To your point, by the way, uh, when I formed my dev team, mm -hmm. didn't even built it directly on Amazon. Right, because I needed to be able to track. I had a, a small pool of money, and I wasn't going to spend it on servers, right? Um, and yeah, I, I also get paid on that stuff, so I want to make more money, um, <laughs> right? Uh, Everyone's but, coin operated, folks. <laughs> well, no, I want to make as much sure. money as possible and reinvest it into growth of the business. Um, but the, the the point I'm making on this is that there's there's there are line of business that are going external. You are absolutely correct. They're going to Amazon. They're going to Salesforce. There are software development teams across the board that also go externally. Now, any well-run IT or organization engages in service strategy and design, right? Says, okay, how can I help my business be more efficient? How can I help it grow? And what services can I provide in IT that are that can be consumed by the business? The reality is it's very common for businesses to consume things like Amazon, to consume things like Azure, and many well-run IT organizations in their, in their service improvement cycles are saying, hey, I need to provide a cloud infrastructure. And that is a reality, and, and with the SDDC type um, technologies available today, um, now the vendors are saying, how can we help you until, uh, instead of how can we stop you? But a challenge with the Amazon side, though, is that, I mean, Amazon EC2 is fabulous if you've got a Greenfield project, right? If any of us tomorrow go and do our own startup, it's almost a no-brainer to say I'm going to do it on Amazon. Yeah, exactly. What kind of a stupid startup would you be right. if you, you were going to make a new, mm -hmm. I don't know, photo sharing mm -hmm. social thing and you didn't use Amazon? Yeah. And, and, and I've talked to people yeah. and it's not a cosplay, right? It's simply this idea that planning is hard. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of risk there. With Amazon, you know, there was this OpEx versus CapEx. If you're a startup with no cash, it's really obvious to say my costs are going to scale linearly um, with the growth of usage. Now let me give a slightly different example. Um, some of you may live in the Bay Area. There is a healthcare uh, company called Panth. Um, they're a subsidiary of Sutter Health. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and I'm going to give a real business example. This is actually a real conversation I had with their IT, and it goes something like this. Hey, why the heck do you send my $20 copay to collection? To which they answer, because you didn't pay it. Kind of obvious, right? And you say, well, I actually tried to write you a check for 100 bucks. You sent me a check back for 80 bucks the last time. Why didn't you just keep that 80 bucks? I don't want to keep track of when the heck I have a copay or just take my darn credit card. And their answer back is, we're sorry, our system doesn't allow us to do that. Bingo. To which I say, okay, great, let's have a conversation. Why is that? And so being the guy that I am, I actually found the IT guy to have that, that conversation with. I can tell you the one part that's not, that never came up and isn't part of the solution. At no point did he say, you know, if I could just take this app and move it over to Amazon, <laughs> that would solve all of my problems. No, but <laughs> Amazon, so and by the way, Amazon or cloud infrastructures are there, they're consumed as a result of changing how you make and deliver software. They're not how you change how you make and deliver software. And that's what people don't realize. But exactly, in his case, right, this is a custom built app, as you can imagine, it's pulling from a bunch of off the shelf elements. And, it, and the real question that comes in is, look, I don't, have, I don't have enough people, we don't have a lot of budget, we went through a big cut X number of years ago. Um, for me, yes, I have a developer who could make the change, but, stand, but being able to test it, utilizes infrastructure that is shared across a bunch of different projects, net net, it takes us nine months to make a major change. There are three other things that are broken, this thing at the end of the day, yeah, we lose some money because we have to take a credit card and we have to go through collections. Um, it's just not a priority. And that's really when we get to the cloud. What issue are we building? Why are people looking at SDDC? It is fundamentally because there are a hundred little things in the business they would like to do differently, supported by IT. And all the dysfunctions we have in IT are standing, are standing uh, between it. And so people's option, people aren't looking at Amazon EC2 versus my existing slightly virtualized infrastructure, SDDC really is about how do we 
upgrade our infrastructure continuously over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, so it allows us to better achieve our business objectives, which in themselves have nothing to do with IT. But part of that is also the consumption um, model that we talked about, you know, like two panels ago on the CapEx piece, is, you know, I think most folks will say, if I buy Amazon, it probably isn't as cheap as if I own it myself, if I have the right utilization, but it's a consumption model that makes sense. It allows them to tie IT expenditure back to the revenue it generates. Employment time and matters a lot. Well, and, see, you know, any kind of CapEx model, there's going to be a step function. You know, it could be very small steps, but there's still a step function in an example like yours. IT is now pay, you know, paying uh, capital dollars to fund infrastructure they're not using and they're starving their developers because they don't have money. Okay, I George, and and then yeah. we've got to go to a question. So okay, George, go ahead. So, yeah. so I was getting a little confused. As, was this a cloud discussion or an Amazon <laughs> discussion? Me too. For a second I'm trying there. to steer it back toward the data center. Yeah. But, but I think your example of this new company in why would you use Amazon and tying it back to software defined data center is, is just, I'm, I'm looking for, I, I don't want to worry about the infrastructure. I'm looking for a service level that I need, whether that service level is availability to me, scalability to me, any of these things. And whether it's a legacy app, which by the way, you know, the way most legacy apps get solved is you throw a whole lot more hardware at it, at least that old thing runs faster. It's expensive, but at least it keeps running and it's a lot easier than rewriting it because they don't have the resources to do it. And now you can virtualize it. And now you can virtualize it. <laughs> <laughs> and sort of run slower yet. But <clears throat> anyhow. Paul, can I throw, can I throw oh. one? <laughs> Sorry. So can I throw one? one Only I if think, it doesn't involve Amazon. <laughs> no, no. And I wanna, I, I, you, I, Amazon keeps bringing it up more and more and more and more. And it's external provider accessible via API. Right? And so in, 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 as you progress in maturity and your test coverage uh, get, gets a little higher, you, one of the more uh, mature patterns is to actually deploy between regions in a provider to pick out you know, Google Compute Engine, to deploy locally to, uh, e to your own OpenStack install, to make sure that all these things are tested each side. Even in, in your own enterprise vert side, you, know, you should be, I don't know, deploying between different versions of your, uh, of your VMware infrastructure. Um, there, there's these patterns which are, you know, it's not, it's not about Amazon, you know, being end-all, be-all. Yeah, it, I, mean, I, I think but it's it doesn't force better work habits. Huh? I, but I think it's they understanding. It does better work habits. Yeah. All right, I, I want to I get to a question here. Go ahead. We have one question. So I'm trying to think uh, in simple terms and some concrete terms about the SDDC. Right, um, and I'm thinking when we say software defined data center, what is that software, right? Um, in the data center, typically you have compute, networks, storage, applications, and services, right? And what is that software for each of these entities? And if we assume that there is a independent and separate software to manage each of these entities, then you are looking at multiple software entities in the data center, right? Um, so then it becomes complex to manage all of these uh, software deployments within the data center. So is that software, is, it, is that ODL, is that OpenStack? And I don't even know what is that software for storage and services. So that's uh, one aspect. And the second aspect I would like uh, you guys to throw some light on is uh, what are some of the pushbacks that you are getting from your customers? Thank you. Okay. So I guess the first, the first question, if I understand correctly, um, what is the software that's defining the data center? Is it vertical software for each individual IT element, or is it some sort of horizontal software right? that's, that's, that's big picture? managing infrastructure, or even is maybe it's the application itself, right? Is that what you're trying to get at? I, okay, I'm seeing some nods, okay. Uh, who wants to take that? Uh, I'm okay. happy to start, and I'll try and do this quickly. Think, think about your mobile phone. For you to be able to make a call, Right, it'd be really wonderful to think, oh, well, I wish there was just one thing. The truth is that we've got billing systems. We've got systems that identify who you are. We've got agreements between carriers. It'll accommodate 75 different telephones running five different OSs in three different versions with different applications running. The reality is that today we need systems that have many different elements that to some extent have some level of complexity, but at the same time they must work with each other. Yeah. So and we're going to have complex systems. We are. At, cars, yeah. at some level Airplanes. what you want is you want every member in your family to think they have their own fridge, right? 
They walk up to the fridge, they open it up, they can put beer in it, whatever they want, nothing gets touched. And Magic what they don't even fridge. know is fridge they all collapse down yeah. into one fridge that I'm the only one that has to manage. Trademark. So what, that that is that, oh. <laughs> what that means is that at some level you're right. You may get to a point where you have a production dev and QA data center for marketing, support, sales, and all these organizations, <laughs> Just right? hold it for He can't get it. There we go. All right, there we go. You know? Now it's pointing right. to your mouth. You might get to a point where you end up, just like we did with virtualization, you end up with, with sprawl, and you end up with you know, exuberant kind of usage of certain type of techniques. And you will have to roll back, and you will have to kind of manage it, and you will have to figure out how to take care of it. But ultimately, what you're talking about is getting to a point where you can take an entire data center and treat it as an object. Right? So in it, you have software routers, firewalls, IDSs, IDPs, server storage, you name it. It's all there. And it just looks like a virtual world that when you're inside of it, it's your data center. And you can break it all you want, and I can go back to a snapshot. So I think you're saying the horizontal approach. Yes. Yeah. Right? So, so, so software-defined storage isn't software-defined storage. It's one element of software-defined data center, correct. period. That's right. That is correct. OK. Oh, because is, is anybody going to disagree? No, I, okay. it, it, it's back to a policy, right? I, wanna, I have an application. I don't really care about all of your infrastructure. I want some place I can run that application, and I want to say, you know, it has a service level, it has a performance component, it has an availability component, what, whatever this service level, I want to simply define it, and it's up to the software-defined network to get me there, it's up to the software-defined storage to deliver the performance, it's up to the virtual machines to make sure, you know, it's got replicated, whatever the combination. Well, and I think that, it, so a lot of the vendors will talk about their own products, how it's software defined. I think a common pattern that I see across um, organizations that have achieved a level of maturity in their software defined infrastructure is a CI, uh, their CI workflows, continuous integration services. They're normally going to be implementing source control of, the, of, uh, of their configurations, right? So whatever is used to define the data center, they, u they use a source control system, Git being very common. Um, they're going to use some sort of governance system to allow for proper authorization of, of managing those patches and changes, Garrett being a very, very common one you're going to see. And these are all open source and free, by the way. And then a test automation framework, um, Jenkins being very, very common that you'll see. And there's a whole bunch of other things that fit within these CI systems. And then you're going to see some sort of way of releasing, conf managing configurations and releasing them into productions, right? So, you know, you hear about Puppet and Chef a lot and Ansible, a lot of other things like this. Now, if you look at going further down the stack, very common that's starting to appear more and more commonly now is some sort of abstraction of the network via SDN controller provides a simple API for these, these re the release management of configuration into your networks, which networks are complex, whether you like them or not. Um, config, uh, cloud management platform, and I hate to call VMware cloud, but you know whether it be Amazon as a CMP, whether it be OpenStack as a cloud management platform, or even VMware, you can actually use VMware as a cloud. Most people don't. Well, hang, um, hang on a second. I mean, aren't they the ones who came up with this term? Um, I mean, you're, you're totally can, marginalizing VMware. I'm not marginalizing anyone. I'm marginalizing <laughs> how people's use of it is. Okay. Most people log into VMware's console, and they right-click on things, and they double-click on things. And they don't, uh, who, who writes to the APIs of their VMware infrastructure? OK, no one in, uh, one person here, Ed Horley, is using VMware as a cloud. Everyone else is using as enterprise vert. Um, so, and not to, not to be demeaning, but, and so, and I know people that write to other APIs, but then on the storage side, you know, object oriented, object storage, by the way, is absolutely huge, um, but this notion of, of configuring, controlling, and, and, and uh, delivering your storage programmatically in orchestration of that stack, um, yeah, the stacks are composable, by the way. Um, they can be, you can insert, you can move different objects in and out. Um, but I think that the core element of a mature SD software-defined data center is this coupling of tests with the software description of the infrastructure, the running of these tests that are fully integrated before release into production, and management of that in a governance model. And I think that's the trick, is right. You need to be able to have a composable stack so you can build a layer, level of complexity and functionality that you need. Some folks might be happy with open daylight, they're good. Others might want to have open stack and open daylight. Others might have something sitting on top of that. Yeah. I think as an industry, we need to make sure there are clear, clean interfaces. Um, you know, things are clearly documented. We have standards around data models, those sorts of things. So you do have that Lego approach, and you can kind of pick and choose. The, the elements that make sense to what you're trying to build. Okay, so the second part of your question was uh, customer 
customer examples. Okay, and let's again let's try to go toward the data center and away from the cloud. So, uh, oh, customer pushback. Okay, okay. So customers that don't want a software-defined data center. Fear. Okay. Who who don't want it or aren't happy with what you're delivering to them. You, you can okay, almost so, go so, back. So let me repeat yeah. that. Uh, so customers who don't want an SDDC, what are they complaining about? What are they objecting to in this approach? I mean, you can almost go back to all the resistance you saw in the past about virtualizing for VMware, right? And you know, people get used to it and they adopt it. And, and you know, sometimes it's a transition period where people have to kind of believe in, in the future and believe in what we're evolving and, and kick the tires and test it and so forth. I see there's a readiness, the customer readiness issue, right? I mean, if you look at a lot of things we talked about, there's skill sets, there's operational processes, all of those things need to be in place. To, I mean, buying the products is easy, buying the software, you know, downloading the software is easy, but having your people, your team, in place that can actually do that, re, you know, reworking workflows across your organization, some of those things, the, the smarter customers recognize, okay, I need to get some of that stuff nailed down before any of this is gonna work the way I want it to. You get a lot of the same response you got before, is it production ready? Right. Is anyone doing it? You know, like all these kind of like underhanded comment, like weasel words, right? Like people are like kind of poking at it and so forth. And, and it's hilarious. You can always go back to all the fights you'd get into about virtualizing servers before. Go back and take those same arguments, change it to virtual routers, switches, firewalls, whatever you want, and you're in the exact same debate. Is it really production ready? I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot of it's just fear. Right. And, and it's training, right? So I'm, you know, I've been an EMC storage admin for 30 years, and I know the ins and outs, and I know how to make it work, and it hasn't failed me yet. You want me to throw it away and go which direction? Okay. Right? It, it's, these are all transitions. They aren't easy to make. You tend to do it in steps, and they, they have to be able to do it in steps. And, and I think that, it, and, and it's from personal experience with the, my customers internally in my own company, so a lot of us lead transitions, but also my customers in the field. Um, uh, the psychology of change. So there's this construct, this vendor, this kind of this vendor construct where you are a Cisco certified internet work expert, and you make more money because you were certified to work on a specific platform in a specific way, um, and that you've spent 10 to 14 years getting to a point in your career while you are the best at managing infrastructures known today. And as we come and we talk to organizations and say, hey, you know what? To execute on that next level of service that you're going to provide to your to your to your um, to your customer or to your internal customers, that you're going to have to reset to zero. And that's a, that's a huge emotional sh uh, uh, shift that happens that says, hey, for 12 to 24 months, I'm going to suck at something, right? And there's a lot of people to be able to challenge their value proposition. And so there's an initial fear. And so one of the things that I see in a DevOps transition is to be inclusive versus exclusive. And a lot of times the passion we feel about these things, uh, we, we're so passionate. We've, we've taken time to... Um, to understand the core concepts of, 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 of quality inherent in the system versus mass inspection, to understand the benefits that we get from these transitions. And we're like, oh my God, you got to totally write Python now, right? And, and, and so you're like, I am a network engineer. I didn't want to become a developer. Get out of my office, right? And so at many times, we always have to think about where were we two years ago? How did we encounter the, uh, the, 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 uh, these changes? And what can we do organizationally to start to arm people with the skills that are bite size and achievable over time, that it's not just saying we're going to get you to the end point, but we're going to start to have achievable, you know, measurable goals. Okay. Neil? Yeah, I was going to say one quick thing, which is in figuring out whether or not you should be an early adopter for something, I, I like to think about three tests. Um, the first test is to what extent do you enjoy the pain? <laughs> right? So there's a pain to being an early adopter of everything. And for some people, that pain is actually positive, not negative, mm -hmm. for a bunch of reasons. Um, the second question is, will it be less painful to you than to somebody else? So for example, if you happen to be really good at dealing with cars, opening up the hood and starting to fiddle with stuff, you, you're probably going to be more able to put it back together than somebody else. Um, and then the third one is, how important is whatever is being promised to you? So if IT is a critical part of what you do, right? If you are Netflix, it is worth investing in Amazon before anybody else does because it is critical to what you're doing. If what you do is really sell life insurance, 
It, yes. may, it may not be as important. You may want to just wait five years. So if you take sort of those three things together and your answer is yes to all three of them, you should certainly look and jump on to, uh, to that technology, that area. If the answer is clearly no, stay the heck away. And I'll say this with, with my project, with open source right now. I really, really don't want a late adopter to go to my website and download <laughs> it. Because let me tell you something, the documentation sucks. Um, in terms of the exact, thank you, yes, you are. By the way, he would welcome contributions. I would. <laughs> uh, use cases are emerging, right? And people to help you and hold your hand are also emerging. And so you'll very quickly waste a whole bunch of people's time, either because you write a blog post about writing how immature it is, um, <laughs> or you just suck up a lot of other people. Please wait a year, yeah. right? On the other hand, if you're that kind of person who has all three of those areas, please contribute because we're going to be able to learn so much and my engineers are going to be thrilled to listen to you and, and hear your environment. I think that often we try and do a broad swath of saying, is this ready for prime time or not? And my big question is for whom? Yep. So masochism, confidence, and no, um, ma prioritization. Skills, skills okay. Okay. and how important is it? Okay. So degree, degree got a question here right, we Keith got a Townsend. question back here. So we've been listening to a, a couple of buzzy keywords today both cloud and SDDC. And the question is, is there a distinction between the two? So, you know, I get into this conversation a lot of times that software-defined data centers, the abstraction of compute, disk, service management, and networking. And in theory, I can abstract services. I can abstract cloud to provide software-defined data center. So is there a, is this, is this an accurate view of it? And is there a real distinction between the two? Because I've heard us talk about uh, enabling SDDC to allow APIs for developers, whether they're DevOps or our ultimate de uh, application developer customers. What's the distinction between the two levels of abstraction? Since I helped write it and popularize the term, let me give you the one sense that I gave two and a half years ago to Steve Harrod. Uh, Horses we mouth, right here, drop, okay. Which is SDDC is an approach to cloud. It's not the only approach, but SDDC is an architectural approach to cloud. And I can expand on that, but I think I agree. I've used a lot of airtime, so I'll let other people talk it, to it. Yeah. And, and it, honestly, one thing that I think came up uh, about 15, 20 minutes ago, SDDC is not a product. Mm -mm. No. 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 Oh, so Absolutely I'm not. sell one. Right. Yeah. Well, I can sell you two SDDCs. <laughs> right. and, and, and just to be clear, I it's an get approach to a cloud yeah. that could be in the data center. It could be a public cloud. It, where it is is completely irrelevant. It's an architectural approach. Yep. Yeah. And anybody who says it's anything different, stop listening to them. Yep. They got a quota. There we go. We've got a definitive answer. So SDDC is not cloud. It's an architectural it's approach. An architectural to cloud. approach to cloud. Okay, we've got another one here, Tom. Yeah, so is SDDC equal to private cloud? No, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so can you have public an implementation? SDDC. Absolutely. Okay. No, can no, no, you no, have it's an approach. You can have a, okay. a public cloud built using yeah. okay. an, an SDDC uh, approach. A yes. follow on question. Um, so, who do you approach in an organization or in an enterprise to promote SDDC? Is it the application developer? Is he? Or she going to be your champion, or is it the IT guy who's already got his backup and says, "Oh yeah, no." Uh, you're likely to hit some emotional barriers, so it depends where. It, the thing that I normally go to go to see is your app dev team. What level of maturity are they in in their software development journey? Um, and normally, and this is a re let me tell you a real world story. I'll obfuscate the customer name. Um, so I had uh, one of the directors dot lines up to me uh, was out in. Um, uh, out, in, out in the Midwest uh, speaking at a symposium for a global customer. And uh, it was giving a presentation on um, stuff we do, stuff on business process consultancy, and software development, and cloud, and all that stuff. And, um, but it was more on the mature, the presentation that, that, that had them deliver was the maturity models, the steps you could do within each of the service areas uh, inside of an IT organization to start to get up to a point where you can provide services similar to Amazon would provide at a similar pace and methodology and quality level to your internal software development team. Now at the end of it, this, the VP of IT for this global company came up and was white. He turned absolutely white. He's like, dude, the talk before, my vice president of application development had just told me that they were starting an agile transition and their service expectation of my organization was something I don't know how to deliver. And 
And, and it's like, what do I do? And so when you get these inflection points, and sometimes this inflection point, and I've been, in, I've been, out, uh, been, out, to, been out with customers where their IT organizations to one-fifth of what it was the year before as budget shifted into active. Now that, not a CIO anymore, a director, um, was absolutely interested in what he could do to provide service to his internal business. But I, where people start to do the change, right now the pattern that I see is frankly where pain has happened. Now there's some highly functioning organizations and oddly enough, they normally are at the highest levels of their ITIL maturity, where they're executing in a continuous improvement model, right? When they get to that point, they're not scared of this change, they embrace it because they see that ITIL, ITSM, Agile, and Cloud are, 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 can, all, can all coexist. Um, but for people that are just running a small shop, they just want to click it, want to go. It's not route valid to them. All right. Uh, Anybody else? Sure. Um, so I've seen it from both. Um, I, it, very large enterprises, the guys driving the applications, um, are looking for ways to deploy in the future. And they're trying to, as a matter of fact, one of them said, if we buy another damn mainframe, I'm going to quit. Um, and his definition of mainframe was pretty broad. Um, <laughs> What weren't really mainframes. Um, on the other hand, that you know, same organization, the IT was just fighting fires. It was easier to put something up than do if they're used to putting up. Um, you go out to another organization where you do have more forward thinking. It's not the guys in the trenches. They don't have time to do it. It's got to be somebody with a strategic view, and it could come apps or infrastructure, but they have to have that strategic view. Okay. Next question. We have uh, one right here. Right here, okay. Uh, hi, we've been talking a lot about vendors and customers, but a lot of us work for VARs and the like probably here. Um, you know, it's been said SDC is not a product and therefore you can't sell it. And sales reps don't like that. Um, <laughs> and sales reps can sell you a million dollar box or sell you maybe some sort of annuity or something like that. They're going to want to sell you that million dollar box. So how do we go about changing the mentality of those sales reps? Um, uh, selling the it. SDDC. How do we sell the SDDC? Oh, to, a, no, to a sales rep, so for an integrator, um, functionally what you were seeing in the market right now is the manufacturers are consolidating their channels. Um, Cisco just announced the consolidation of their channel um, at their partner summit, and the, the removal of the middle tier, and the, uh, the increasing of barriers to participate. We're also seeing, and VMware's done this too, by the way, um, what we're also seeing is a shift from a resale model, which, uh, which your, your value in a resale model is a constrained access to, to equipment to sell, to a direct model where the, where the manufacturers bypass resellers who don't add value. Oddly enough, there's a V in value-added reseller. Um, most of the technology manufacturers are shifting into what's known as an ISV model, where they're building their channels around uh, companies that can develop software, do process transformations, and then drive. And you, you mentioned an interesting thing. There's a great book called Consumption Economics written in 2011 um, that shows this shift in consumption from the classic technology sales model is to go ahead, throw a high-cost sales force, and get about 80 per, 70 to 80 percent of, that, of, of that, that dollar value extracted from the customer and then the salesperson goes on, cl on their club trip, right? What's happening now is we see the fractional consumption or a freemium model, the Dropbox model, or an IT organization or even the WebEx model or Google Hangout model where the IT organization tries it out, one to ten people. They do a self-selection. A lot of bloggers, this is why bloggers are important now, is because they'll read other community members' uh, you know, ex experiences around this. And then the cost of sale many times is the same, but then you have to focus on increasing the adoption rate of that, being able to actually have analytics and visibility into the triggers of it. Um, for the VAR side, and you know, I run a line of business in an integrator, I mean, absolutely some good visibility into this. What we're likely to see as the manufacturers consolidate the channels is um, uh, execution of Tiffany Bouvier's uh, presentation. How do you deal with cloud? You fire your sales force. Um, not saying I recommend it, but it's commonly that you're going to see a new class of salespeople emerge. Uh, the buddy buddy, I took my, my sales, my manufacturer sales rep out to lunch and he flipped me a deal, being replaced with more of the project manager type, a uh, more technical salesperson who has a deeper understanding of customer processes. I, I think it's Boy, more I would than love that. to see that salesperson. Yeah. I, I think it's more than that. Just sorry, very quickly. Okay. Oh, it's I think the answer is stop selling boxes. Yeah. Which is the wrong thing on VARs is they're used to going in saying, I have a technology for you. And That's what we need to do now, 
what we need to do now is teach people to ask questions, right? The SDDC in itself, what problem does it solve? Well, it depends who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Is We need, whether it's VARs, whether it needs to be manufacturers, we need to go in and understand the underlying business of these companies and understand where is IT an enabler and where does IT stand in the way of their business goals. Okay, from, and from, from a that, you put the elements right. together. But that from a practical that. perspective, but you're that's consulting. That's not sales. I mean, well, I understand what you're saying, but in terms oh, no, of no, the business. best sales but, but, is So, so let me turn it into a sales, which is software. Come on. We've been selling software for years. You sell the vision. You deliver what you have on the truck. Right? <laughs> so SDDC is the vision. Shh, you're not supposed to tell people that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you have components still today on the truck, right? Whether you have a software-defined storage or a software-defined network. Not as big as it make it expensive, though. No. Well, but you're putting together the vision and, and you're going to sell, uh, you are going to sell a solution at the end of the day, but you're going to have to make it up with the components so, you have. I think, can I, can I, can I, and I, by the way, my, my, and I, man, I built a $100 million line of business in my own business before taking over this role two, uh, almost two years ago. You know, don't let the beard fool you. I am a businessman. Um, uh, the, uh, it's very important to think. So what you're describing is a product-oriented solution sale model. And what we're seeing evolve is, is what's called insight selling. So um, the Challenger Sale is a great book which actually describes insight selling, which is, God forbid, understanding your customer's problems, teaching them a problem they didn't know they had, helping them make more money, be more successful at their business, which increases consumption of what you're selling. It's actually closely tied oh, to, the, to the driving value. It's hard. <laughs> we are going to see a mass consolidation of the systems integrators and resellers. We're already seeing it, by the way. The financial constraint, so there's, by the way, to the point of if you're at a, a, a reseller with less than 5% service attach rate, in my opinion, um, the, uh, the impact of commoditization, uh, lowering costs of hardware, combined with um, the different funding models for large VARs, probably going to see about, my guess here, 50% of, of resellers with less than 5% drop off the radar within 18 months. The rest of them are going to be consolidated up by, by larger globals with consultancies. I mean, from our perspective, Collins Company is doing exactly the right thing. In terms I'm not of, pitching a com my company. I'm not please. pitching it, but you know, if you want to look at a model, they're, you know, they're taking the things we offer and then wrapping legitimate value add wrapped around that. From a, the piece I was objecting, from a practical perspective, if you owned a sales organization, is you need to transition that organization to be able to make that or you need to churn them or, or do something. You just can't manage a sales organization and say, okay, go ask a lot of questions. Yeah. We're going to stop having commit calls. They're not going to get fired. You'll get fired. So and there are two pieces. Understand that, I mean, this is a good model for the types of things. How do you make money in this model when, you know, CapEx is getting de-emphasized. We're moving to different consumption models. Uh, you know, that's, that's how but kind of understand the underlying what you need to do to the business to be able to actually pull that And it's not that Boolean, off. right? I mean, there are, there are stages of it, right? right? Yeah. I mean, you can work on different pieces as you go along. And then, you know, what we did with VMware is, you know, we would just basically say, hey, buy the software, and then, you know, pick up as much hardware as you can and balance it out, right? So think, uh, sorry about which interrupting. Is, uh, I mean, you're right in that most VARs today will have to transition into a much larger service component. Um, yeah. Yesterday. Uh, if, if you want the truth, I believe most VARs today take orders. Um, they, they don't actually sell. It's demand fulfillment. Yeah. And that is a challenge. So that, that, that's a business model. If you actually look at the big R VARs, which are like big resale, low value, right? Um, it's a business model. It's, a, it's, it's, it's predicated on being able to constrain cost of fulfillment and have very easy fulfillment. By the way, manufacturers love companies like that because right. they'll take they'll they'll resell at one to two points above cost. Um, you can go through Cisco's publicly traded documents, Brocade's publicly yeah. traded public documents ar around this and look at how their channels are filled. That being said, the the reliance on the res the pure resell uh, uh, resell integrator um, actually exposes these tech companies to risk, which is why you see them reforming their channels. Cisco, Brocade, EMC, NetApp, they're all facing these headwinds in the market sure. due to lack of relevancy of their channel and they're solving the problem. I think it provides an opportunity for smart people that we see participating social media um, uh, to go ahead start their own businesses start their own practices within the, within the businesses if we saw remember early on inside VMware we saw small boutique consultancies which grew up to some of the most powerful integrators in the world um, and so it's it, while some people see this as a bad thing I see this as a great opportunity for people who are incredibly relevant in the market to be incredibly relevant and helpful to the customers um, but yeah we're, we're gonna see a, it's gonna be a giant mess make sure your resume is updated I mean, I mean there's a great I most of that 
that, there's one, one slight difference, which is what we see in, this is not just in IT, is you tend to get at the uh, a barbell economy, yeah. where I actually think there is a role for the person who's your big R, and that's sure. CDW. And CDW isn't going away, right? So if you look in your own things, I mean, I just bought a new house and I looked at it, it's so funny. We've got some IKEA stuff in the kids' room, and then we have some higher end stuff that looks really, really nice. And I find myself as a consumer, as IT, that either you solve a problem for me, and I'm really willing to pay you money if it's a problem that matters, or you don't, at which point I just want the cheapest price ever, and I'm going to go down to the um, bottom. The yep. in the middle of you're charging me some margin to get me halfway to solving the problem, and then let me go. It's useless to me. But there's, there's, but there's all. But if you look at so the, the big, the big challenge of any the big R resale model is actually access to capital, yep. right? So one of the one of the if if you sell a hundred million dollar deal or say say do a hundred million dollar deal, right? You're going to have that on net ninety terms, right? And so you're going to have to float. $25 million, so you're going to have to go to GE and go, oh, please, oh, please, please extend my line of credit. And you're going to manufacture, like, please call GE and let, let me extend my line of credit. So what you saw is a small group of people that access uh, money men that are actually, there's a small group of people behind most of the large integrators out there, a lot large VARs out there. And as we move towards software defined everything, as you're selling a license, you now, you can negotiate directly with your vendor for terms saying, you know what, don't charge me for it until the customer actually provides me with payment. And as hardware itself becomes cheaper, it provides an opportunity for those that actually provide value to not be constrained by the money in the, by the money men in the industry. Um, it, it, that's a fundamental shift that's happening now that people miss. But it's also that is also why the big R VARs go out of business. Right. So, that, so, now, so we're hearing basically that the answer to the question is that this is going to really stir things up. Yes. And it's going to screw a lot of things up. But there's a big opportunity for people who are willing to try to do something different. There's a huge opportunity. Yourself, I'm, yeah, excuse me? Fire your sales rep. Well, they'll fire themselves. So it, it, what's interesting with sales reps is you pay them on a, a highly leveraged commission, and they will leave when they don't make money. It's, it's pretty odd. Uh, it's weird, weird that way. I mean, there's a huge upside, right? The market is knowledge constrained. The number of people that actually understand this stuff will give you, you know, unbiased opinion is still relatively small. Yeah. So for folks, you know, partners, resellers, uh, there's a huge leverage point in there to be that trusted, you know, that trusted advisor for your for your customer base because the, the skill sets is, are just not out there from anywhere. Okay. We have another question over here. I see Mr. Metz. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a question or, a, or more of a comment. I I, <laughs> I think that the different sales models that you're talking about um, are pretty interesting. I, lo I love the virtual fridge idea, by the way. I think that's fantastic. Um, I'm even more of a fan of the, the telephone analogy and the telephone system analogy because I think that, unfortunately, the metaphor doesn't really transfer that much, and especially when we start coming into the way that these things are going to be wind up being sold. The problem with the, the software-defined data center as we know it currently, unlike the telephone model, is that there are way more overlaps across the entire board in the data center than we have in the telephone model. Yes. So what we use to determine to term, uh, any particular solution can mean anything according to who's talking. Mm -hmm. So just as an example, let's talk about software-defined storage. Mm -hmm. Software-defined storage can mean one thing according to a software array vendor, something to a virtualization hypervisor vendor, and something to a fabric vendor. That's right. They all use the same term. And they overlap at different points. Great. Right? So unlike the telephone system, which has very discrete elements which you can insert into, um, right. you don't really have that kind of you know, easy input, input, input into play. But the other issue with the telephone metaphor is look how long it took us to get to the point where you can actually look at your phone and get these simple applications on it. I mean, it, it took the AT&T breakup in 1984 and all the innovation that came after that, the re-regulations, the mobility that came in the 90s, the cost reduction as a result of it, that's 30 years to get to where we are right now. So can I ask, yes. one, there's one thing that's, that is in just a fundamental difference now. We used to be constrained by the ability to manufacture hardware, to lay cable in the ground. We, used to, we were constrained by the ability to spin silicon now, the opportunity to innovate, the opportunity to invent, and the opportunity to share the benefits and also share the burden. Part of open source, by the way, is sharing the burden of stamen engineering of something that supports an unfair advantage. Right? Um, uh, Mr. Meyer there, CTO, ah, crap, uh, you know, CTO of Brocade, made a great statement uh, that I really agree with. It used to be your value is an artifact. 
Now the value is your ability to create faster. Right? And so what's happened as everything you can, as, as development of solutions is primarily within software and abstracted from the hardware, that we're seeing the steamroll effect, both from expanding our development teams to sizes never heard of before, OpenStack, Open Daylight, et cetera, to, to being able to, even in proprietary stuff, uh, proprietary software, building them, I don't have to worry about building a cloud platform, build it on Amazon, but focus on these test-driven de development, continuous integration, where the more features you add, the more tests you add, the faster you develop. This is a fundamental change in how, how innovation is happening. Right? Is fundamental. Really yeah. S software is a fundamental change, absolutely, and, and you're right. Open source has its advantages, but you know, or corporate or closed doesn't really matter. Yeah. There, there is dramatic change going on right now. Um, there, there are questions as to where those interfaces are, and they'll continue to get worked out. I, I have to tell you that, I mean, what, to me, one of the biggest, most interesting changes on the storage side is the operating systems. Whether it's VMware, whether it's Microsoft, the amount of technology they're putting into the operating system that you can now leverage and you don't have to recreate is significant. Mm. And it's enabling much more interesting software-defined storage capabilities. So it's because softwareization and then modularization and then modu as well. Exactly. Yeah. It's really both. Yeah. I think that modularization of taking a monolithic system and decoupling into smaller systems that are highly covered by tests, it allows you to say you don't have to upgrade the entire system to increase its value. That's right. You don't meet a lot of 300 pound ants. <laughs> yeah, you know. and, exactly. And in general, your points, by the way, are well taken, which is you're absolutely right that today it's I mean, it's nice to say, like the telephone system, everything could work well together. And the reality is, today, it doesn't easily work together. I mean, this is part of why we've got open source projects like Open Daylight, is because you've got a whole bunch of, you've got, in a sense, the platform as the lottery. A lot of people who want to buy that ticket and hope to win big and keep talking about how my way is better and everybody else's way is stupid. Now, in the past, that took a long time. By the way, telephone systems, there didn't initially, there wasn't initially one. There were a whole bunch of them. In fact, even down to the beginning, beginning of this last century, we had people using the barbed wire on their fences to create uh, phone systems out in rural areas that you, then you had to connect to. So I mean, we've got, if you go back and read the history of the phone system, we've gone through every permutation of different things and did come together. I think, though, you're absolutely right that said there are a set of things today that make our ability to spin through these things faster. The size of the IT industry, the number of bright minds that we have is like nothing we've ever seen, right? In the same way as it, as it took a thousand years to invent the pencil. But since then, in not that many years, we've invented, you know, not just the ballpoint pen, but the pen that writes in space, and the word processor, and the computer, and, you know. And I'm very familiar with the, the standing on the shoulders of giants, and I'm <laughs> extremely familiar with the history of the telephone system. Good. So I agree with you on that. But my, to me, the risk winds up being, in the terms of the software-defined data center, the shell game effect of taking the complexity from one, moving it over here, taking the, 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 the library of information and giving it from, taking it from this priest and giving it to that priest who happens to be a developer now. And ultimately, when you look at the system in a holistic view, yeah. you may be faster over here, but now you've got a bottleneck over here. So that's so the risk. Make sure there's a net gain. <laughs> oh. Well, transcripts of the speech are available by sending two dollars to my address. We, yes. can, we can talk about theory constraints, right? And you can talk about the, the and by the way, what you described is the bottle, we become faster over here, bottleneck over here, mm -hmm. is the primary driver for the growth of public clouds. As software development be, became faster and IT organizations were not able to provide services at the same level, the, cons the, the constraint was identified, constraint is IT, was subordinated by moving externally to a cloud provider and the system rega it, it regained normal pr the optimal production. Uh, but I think that, uh, that at, at, and, and by the way, this will normalize. People inside of IT organizations actually want to do good for the business, just like the development and are improving the services they offer. But I think what we're seeing, SDDC is a, a term around it, but functionally we're seeing the industrial revolution in IT. We are manufacturing IT versus artisanally, artisanally crafting it. And uh, the yeah. same, and this is happening across technology. Right. And as we move to the industrial revolution, the agile development is, by the way, taking manufacturing process and applying it to software from, from owning Ono and Deming 50 years ago. Right? Toyota production management system I use every single day in my development team. Right? And so what you're looking at here is, will things accelerate? Well, just like they did in the dust Revol revolution, things accelerated. We're going to see it inside of our own te the technology as we consume. 
right. my opinion. So, it's time to wrap up, okay. but what you, um, you go ahead. We, well, we, we so, so last thing is we are way down this curve in many ways. I mean, so I heard it earlier, virtualization, go back. I mean, that has gotten this whole momentum going. So it's not like we're starting today. We started 10, 12 years ago, maybe more. My math isn't so good right now. Um, and so it, it isn't happening overnight. And, you know, we're a long ways down. We've got a long ways to go, but there's a lot that's happened. The, the second point on these choke points, absolutely. There will be a choke point every day. And when we solve this one, there'll be another one. And that's what keeps us in business. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys very much. Um, thank you, audience. Uh, again, we're going to be posting all of these things to uh, YouTube and to the Tech Field Day website. Uh, we'll be uh, posting presentations as well. Um, thank you guys who watched online. Uh, there was a lot of content, a lot of commentary on Twitter. Um, and thank you, panel. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to wrap up the panels, and um, Tom Hollingsworth is going to wrap up a little bit with a few words to the rest of you. Uh, thanks for staying all the time, but uh, for now, I'm going to step off.